and you're good to go, Julie. So it's up to you whenever you want to get started. I don't know if you want to let more people stream in or. Oh, I see admitting people. I have that yeah. power. Yeah, so we well, can... we'll go ahead and get started and people can come in as they. Go, Julie, so it's up to you whenever you want to get started. Sorry about that. More people. All right. There you go. That's all right. No worries. It takes up. A lot of people to help out with this. So I'm going to share my screen and do a little introduction, and then we will um, start the cafe. Let's see. Can everybody see that? All right. So welcome to our first AFO Cafe of 2023. My name is Julie Jedlicka, and I am the president of AFO um, right now for the next year and a half. And um, AFO Cafe was started just um, a little over a year and a half ago as a way to bring people together, um, relaxing on a Friday afternoon and informally have a conversation about birds. So if you have your you know, cafe mug or drink with you. You can go back in your recliner, relax, and listen to some fun, inspiring uh, talks, and then kind of contribute to that after the presentation with um, a good discussion. Uh, a little history of AFO. So we are were established in 1922. We just celebrated our hundredth year anniversary last year. And we're a nonprofit group focused on um, encouraging the study of birds and the conservation of birds in their natural habitats. Um, we focus on bridging both professional and amateur ornithologists, bird banding stations. And we have a strong focus uh, in Latin America, especially, and uh, even more so globally, looking at outreach, scientific meetings, and grant programs. We're excited to announce that our next um, second Ornithological Congress of the Americas is taking place this summer. So mark your calendars, August 1st through 4th in 2023, uh, will be part of an international meeting of Ornithological Societies in Gramado, Brazil. So this is AFO partnering with the Neotropical Ornithological Society and uh, the Brazilian Ornithological Society. Should be a great and exciting time. We hope we can see you there. Um, more info on that to come. We have two upcoming talks we wanted to let you all know about. Uh, the first one is a joint talk with the Wilson Ornithology Society geared towards students and early professionals about the Ornithological Council. So we wanna make it um, available to learn what is the Ornithological Council, why is it important, and what tools does it have that can make your research and your life working with birds easier. So there's a lot of great information there, and if you're interested in that event, it's February 10th, and we'll be advertising more uh, and have a Zoom link that you can uh, register on so you can participate in that discussion. And then we have another AFO Cafe next month. So we're excited to have Antonella Gorosabel and Julieta Pedrana. Um, they're going to be both leading a conversation on the Rudy headed goose uh, from the plot to the landscape perspective. So uh, email will come out so you can register for that AFO Cafe next month. <laughs> Uh, AFO Cafe is brought to you by Avanet Research Supplies. So if you need mist nets, other excellent uh, research supplies for working with birds or bats in the field, please check out Avanet. Um, they're a wonderful organization and have a lot of great research supplies that you may need. Um, we want to hear from you. You're part of our community attending this cafe. Uh, we're looking for other AFO cafe speakers. So if you're interested in maybe coming to this platform and talking about some fun research that you're doing or you have someone you'd like to nominate, feel free to send the name and the subject matter to afo.communications at gmail.com. 
and uh, we'll be in touch. So uh, we wanna encourage people that are here today to become AFO members if you are not already. Uh, for more information, you can go to our website at afonet.org. Um, but becoming a member really supports our organization and allows us to support um, budding researchers and our grant program uh, that encourages Latin American research and all of that. So feel free to become a member or give a donation there. And last but not least, it's my pleasure to introduce our uh, first AFO Cafe speaker of 2023, uh, past president of AFO and a friend of mine, Dan Ardia. He'll be talking to us about birds and art from a historical and ecological perspective. So welcome, Dan. I will stop sharing my screen and allow you to take over from here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julie and Matt. Um, so I am excited to talk with you today about a new project, or at least a new chance to talk about a project um, I've been working on on the side. And I'll admit to being a little bit nervous because this is not an area of primary expertise. Um, so wandering off into other disciplines like art history, um, we all sometimes have a tendency to think we understand the basics and then turn out to feel ourselves to be fools. So I hope this is a friendly audience where people here are thinking about birds, um, but here we go. So um, so I'm an ornithologist by training and temperament, um, but I've become interested in art over the last 10 or so years. And my first sort of foray into thinking about art and science was being fascinated by the work of um, what sometimes people call the pointillists, but they call themselves the chromo -lumerists. This is George Seurat and others who tried to weave together color theory at the time that it was being developed in the late 1800s to think about how to paint scientifically. It's a very fascinating moment in the history of art and science. Um, and so that caused me to spend a lot of time in museums where all of you that spend time looking at art know that you see lots of birds, birds as both the central focus of an object or a piece of art, but or, or they could be birds just that are peripheral. So here are just random pictures I've taken in museums. I found myself taking pictures of interesting birds. And then before I knew it, I had thousands of photos and it got me thinking about different patterns um, that one might see. So a very sort of inductive kind of thinking of just using observations to sort of think more. So I'm gonna do three things today. Um, I'm gonna give you a little bit of, of art history background of how it intersects with ornithology using some examples of work um, not done by me, but to give you a flavor um, of how uh, people are thinking about sort of the material history of objects and art history and how that interfaces with birds. Um, then I'm gonna talk about a project that my student and I did doing kind of a biodiversity sample of birds um, in art. And then lastly, uh, I'm gonna, if time allows, uh, talk about some cool contemporary examples uh, using birds to, to address larger societal things. So, okay. So, um, so I want to point out that there's two recent books that have come out that have been interested in birds and art that are not uh, on the topic I'm particularly interested in, but they might be ones that you are. So, uh, of course, the history of scientific illustration is is a quite an interesting and important one, um, and the recent book came out looking at some just some examples of ornithological art through the times. That's not the focus I'm taking. Um, although I will point out that as more and more attention is paid to this, it's clear that there were lots and lots of scientific illustrators working with birds uh, beyond the, the most famous men, white men that we know of. And here's just one example of, of Sarah Stone painted this beautiful, beautiful parrot from the 1700s. And of course, lots of people are interested in birds as symbols. So this is a recent book that came out that was interested in how birds are used in sort of a larger symbolic art history context. Um, and that's also not the, the topic of our discussion today, nor my particular interest in birds. Um, so I am going to use an art historical example here. So I just want to define what I mean. You know, art history is, of course, a field. Um, many of you have colleagues, if you teach in schools that study art history that you might have interacted with. And it's the idea of using the aesthetics and material or objects 
um, to think about broader contexts of, uh, of history and society. Um, and so there's lots of, of great artwork that's out there that sort of are really useful in what you're teaching about the history of science, like this image by um, William Derby, looking at an experiment with a vacuum pump that where the bird is, of course, both the central object from the perspective of the bird, but also not central to the overall image. Um, so art historians are, are interested, of course, in many, many questions and birds show up in lots of still lifes and we'll return to still lifes in a second. Um, and so one subfield of art history that has become more prominent or interdisciplinary field in the last couple of decades is the field of animal studies. Many of you have probably been hearing about this or even uh, doing some of this yourself, which is the idea of thinking about how animals are represented and how that gives us insights into various questions about what makes humans distinct, how do humans interact with animals, um, how animals, how do animals represent uh, cultural values, um, those kinds of things. And so the little case studies I'm going to work through now are sort of things that are emerging in this field of animal studies. Um, so we use the parrot as an example, and it's not my example necessarily. So here's a book called The Parrot and Art. Um, and so I pulled some examples from this, and then I'll weave in some recent scholarship. So parrots, of course, are ubiquitous in photos, and here are two famous ones, many of which you might have seen this Monet painting on the left um, from the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Uh, it's a rather large painting, and the parrot, as you can see, is, is relatively centrally featured. Um, and the parrot is a great example of ways in which it represents different values uh, and how artists are using the parrot um, either uh, explicitly to, to connote some kind of information about themselves or what they're painting, or just as a backdrop that might represent just sort of like an implicit cultural norm of, of the existence of parrots in people's backgrounds. Um, so parrots, of course, maybe not, of course, have an important religious symbolism that shows up in a lot of early um, Renaissance art, in part because it was thought to represent some aspect of, of the virginal motherhood of the Virgin Mary. Um, so there's lots of interesting examples of, of parrots showing up in early religious art. And parrots, of course, were, were always a puzzle, just like they are to us, uh, their high intelligence, their ability to mimic speech. And for people, the thought of animals as being, I mean, of birds as being pretty dumb compared to people. It was sort of remarkable that parrots were the exceptions. Um, we later see that, that parrots take on a symbolism of the exotic. And that's kind of what I'm interested in, in these examples is sort of how this, this exoticism first gets represented in art and then how it represents aspects of colonialism. Um, so here's an interesting Van Gogh painting here. Um, sorry. Um, the green parrot. Um, here's some some additional examples from later in time. Uh, and so what we see are that parrots begin first representing a very expensive pet that only wealthy people um, could afford parrots. And then eventually as parrots are transported more and more into Europe, they become a backdrop like this would be a man in a park that people would give money to uh, for walking around and letting you hang out with his parrots. Um, and so how does this intersect with ornithology? Uh, so this is an interesting paper uh, that I discovered in a student's honors thesis um, that was referencing a paper written in Portuguese where these researchers were interested in trying to do work on conservation of where parrots, parrots that could be identified to species might show up at different time periods and different artworks uh, over the years. Um, and so they took a very explicit identification approach of, of trying to identify the parrots, particularly rare parrots that might show up um, in European artworks, which is a really cool way to match up sort of the science of identification and biodiversity, as well as where the different ranges are of these birds, uh, because they couldn't be confused with other things. It seems unlikely that a Italian artist would paint a very specific species of parrot that might only have been found in Brazil unless they had seen it. And I don't mean that they saw it by traveling to Brazil, but I mean that the parrot had been transported to Europe. So, um, so here's just some examples of, of where rare macaws are showing up in interesting artwork. So here's one on the right hand side from 1752. Um, here's another um, from the 1600s. Uh, and again, the authors here are attempting to identify these parrots uh, down to species. Um, and it's important to note at this time period, uh, parrots, especially macaws, were a prestige symbol. Um, so people were spending a lot of money and a lot of time to get these things. Um, 
just more more paired paintings. Um, and I am waiting room here. So a more specific example is, is really a great example of how this animal studies field is intersection with art history to study what they would say, you know, in humanist talk, the material history of an object. In this case, the material history of the object is a bird. Um, and so this is a, a paper by an author from Australia who um, was interested in how a cockatoo shown here um, in the box and blown up showed up in a Italian altarpiece in 1496. So if you know anything about cockatoos, you know that they're only found um, in Australia and New Guinea and that part of the world, that they were not common in Italy. And in 1496, there would not have been much direct European, any direct European colonization of that area. So then how did a cockatoo end up in um, Italy to end up in this painting? So here, you can see 1496, I highlighted the date. Here's a picture of a cockatoo from the internet. And here's the range of this silver-crested cockatoo. So how did this thing get to Italy to show up in, um, in art? And so what the author was doing was tracing trade routes to try to figure out how uh, a live cockatoo might have been transported um, from, and of course, this map that she produced you know, cuts off um, access to Australia here, but you can see that the Europeans, you know, the Portuguese sort of first did their colonization and imposing their, their imperial will on the Indian Ocean, not until 1497. So after that parrot showed up, out of that cockatoo showed up. And so what the researcher was interested in trying to study representations of cockatoos and parrots to get a sense for, for how the material history, in this case, the, the traveling of an exotic species that represented the exotic that had a, a level of prestige uh, would show up in these images. So um, parrots very popular in Roman mosaics. Here we go all the way back to the second century BC. Um, on the left-hand side is the representation of the species and on the right-hand side um, is the actual picture, an actual picture from the internet. Um, and so the idea here in this, these kinds of animal studies kind of projects is to use artistic representations that can be matched to species to ask something about the time and space in which birds are moving from one place to another. So, um, and so to get back to the cockatoo, here would be an example of the kinds of trade routes that might have brought something to Italy to show up in that photo, um, which means that of course that live cockatoos were being transported, maybe kept as pets and then sent to Italy. So um, the last little example on this little art historical case study opening um, is thinking now about, again, exotic birds um, from the perspective of how they represent more direct European imperialism. Um, so if we use the Dutch Golden Age as an example, which was a period in the 1600s um, when the Dutch ruled the seas, so to speak, um, and the Dutch East India Company was set up and they were beginning to take colonial possession of uh, Indonesia and that area, um, as well as in South America, um, are their traders and explorers bringing back wildlife um, that would show up in images. So. Many of you are probably familiar, the, the Dutch love to paint birds. There's lots of great examples of still lifes. Um, as ornithologists, we both, both might find this an interesting photo for the very real representation. We know if you've ever tried to, to paint or draw birds, which I haven't, but it certainly looks hard. People tell me it's hard. These are really nice representations, but of course they're dead, that might make us sad. Um, but I'm sure you've been in museums and seen lots and lots of still lifes of birds. Um, so what we see then is in this period in the 1600s that species that would never have been found in the Netherlands are now showing up in their art. So here's a Jan Steen picture who drew lots of genre scenes, sort of scolding people for behaving badly. Um, and in the background was a, a macaw. He had his own macaw. Where in the 1600s, how did this get to the Netherlands? It would have come from colonial trade and eventually imperialism. Um, and so this just shows you the area that the Dutch controlled during this period of time. And so this small country in Europe was able to, to use its, its will and resources to send ships out and about and, um, and colonize these different parts of the world and bring back things. And so in particular, we'll look at some examples of birds that show up here from South America in Dutch art at this time. So um, here's just another painting that has, uh, that's labeled, you can see it doesn't even have the macaw in it, but it has a beautiful scarlet macaw. This is from the, the 1630s. Um, Here's a Franz Snyder painting, also from the 1630s, 
that has a number of species, some of which like the hoopoe that would have been found in Europe and others like this macaw that would not. Um, and in particular, we have a great example of a painter um, whose name I won't pronounce right, but I think it's, it's Eric Schumann who was uh, particularly interested in painting birds um, and he was brought to rich people's homes where he ended up painting a lot of birds from aviary. So we have a great record of birds that he painted. And if you know these birds, you know that they're only found in South America and yet they're showing up in Dutch aviary. So it's this great example of how wildlife from one place is coveted by individuals in other places. Um, pink vulture also native to the new world showing up in these photos. So before I move on to my, my actual study, um, I just want to say that part of what's interesting about this work and the work of others now is, is to, to bring forth the, the people that have been doing art, doing illustrations, for example, that might not normally have been part of our canon when we think of people like Audubon. And so there's an example of, this is a painting, a portrait of Maria Sibella Merian, who was a very uh, important early painter, natural history, um, who traveled across South America um, and did a number of these really detailed uh, watercolors. Um, but just not as famous as John Gio. So, okay. So that was just like a little bit of an art historical flavor of sort of how people are bringing together studies of actual species of birds, their geographic range, um, and thinking about they, how they intersect with larger aspects of, of human culture. So the project that my student and I did, as I said, I spent a lot of time wandering around museums and these are all pictures of birds seen in various forms. Um, got me to think like, what are the patterns of how birds are represented uh, in museums? And so my student and I were interested in sort of doing an initial pilot study to get a sense for how birds are represented, what species, what families, what kinds of objects, um, what kinds of birds are collected, what's the difference between birds that are central in an object versus those that are more peripheral. So we started by doing some database searching. We chose uh, four different museums, the British Museum, the Met, and then two branches of the Smithsonian Art Museums. And we had standardized searches of using bird and avian and a whole suite of different characteristics in order to download and, and code images that we pulled from uh, these databases. And we ended up getting about 550 images. As you'll see, clearly not enough uh, to make firm conclusions, but enough to get a sense of a proof of principle. So the one thing that's clear is that the objects that would show up in our database search have a number of biases, just like fossils. Those of you that teach about the role of the fossil record talk about the biases of fossils. What are the fossils that are available for us to study? What are, are the objects that are available for us to study? So here are some of the potential biases that we've been thinking about and we'll try to control as best we can. There's an abundance bias, right? Bird species or bird families that are more abundant are much more likely to be seen and incorporated into art. Um, people, of course, not only need to see it, they need to actually produce an object, so they need to care about it. And of course, some of that represents human preferences. People might like a uh, macaw more than a sparrow. Um, if they produce a piece of art, it needs to, of course, have a chance to be preserved. So there's a material bias. Um, more recent pieces of art are going to be more represented in our database than those that are older. Um, there's likely to be what we might call a habitat bias, both in terms of, of where collectors visit and which regions are valued. And so we know, and you'll see in the database, that areas like Europe are much more represented than other parts of the world. Um, of course, people might seek to collect it. How does it end up in a museum? Somebody views the object as, as worthy of collecting. So there could be birds used in various forms and various artistic objects that aren't collected. They, of course, need to end up in the museum and entered into the museum's database. And then they need to have been coded in a way for us to have been able um, to get them in our search. So there has to be a, a bias towards those objects which museums put online and are labeled in such a way as to be picked up. So, so what we did then is went, and as I said, we picked up 500 images and we identified them to, uh, to order. Um, and here are the basic patterns. And some of them will not surprise you uh, if you look at lots of paintings or sculptures or uh, objects with birds in them. Uh, people love passerines and they, they love hawks and eagles. So you can see that, you know, of our objects, 25% of them were passerines. Um, almost 20% were exhibit forms. Uh, of course, you, you know, and I'll show you some pictures of, of chickens in a little bit, but peacocks and those kinds of things. 
um, ducks show up, and then other uh, orders are much less common, hornbills, woodpeckers, uh, kingfishers. So this is sort of the general patterns that we see. Um, as I said, but these aren't necessarily representative of what people choose, and where they choose uh, to put them into works of art um, based on the biases that I just gave you, but it gives you a sense of some of these patterns. So, um, so if we break it down by region, first we, we tried to break it down by um, whatever the affinity was that the museum itself would have created. So which part, which people in Nigeria painted this or whether this was from Ecuador or whatever it was, but they're just not a big enough sample size. So we, we grouped this by biogeographic regions using the, the common standard now for the six biogeographic regions um, and then broke down by the different orders. So you can see sort of roughly that breakdown. Again, this is, this is just basic pattern forming just to get a sense for, for what we might see. Um, and so some groups like the ones bolded here show up in most places, right? Not surprisingly, there's a separate forms in every biogeographic region of the world and they show up in all of the artwork that we see. Ducks, the same thing, um, galliforms. Others are much more range restricted Right, so if we look, you know, where do we see hornbills? Not surprisingly, in the places where hornbills are found, although that might not have been the case. Maybe hornbills, like parrots, were transported around and show up, but they don't. They don't show up in a lot of European art. Um, and so then, if you look at it as a breakdown of how the different orders are distributed across the different geographic regions, you can see there's a little bit of a bias, um, and of course, that's probably driven in part by the total sample size. So, as of course, the sampling number of objects were picked up, like in Europe, um, the greater proportion of orders were picked up. So, so if we approach it from just an ecological sampling standpoint, here we just have a, a little simple plot of the number of images that were sampled and the number of orders that were represented, it's not surprising. It looks kind of like a species area curve. And that's our hope is to sort of go through the data in more detail and look at the from a species area perspective. Um, like I said, this was very early idea to get kind of a proof of principle. And then the goal is to do some high throughput uh, downloading of images to go from 517 images to 5,000 or 50,000. So, so let's just look at some examples because part of maybe what you want to see are pictures of birds and art. Um, and so here then are some different representations over time and space uh, by some different orders. And so here uh, we see our enseriforms. Uh, if you spend any time looking at Egyptian art, you know that, that they love ducks and swans and geese. Um, but here's a little Central American swan object. Here's a bowl. Here's a swan showing up in a Greek allegory. Um, and so on and so forth. Everyone loves chickens. Roosters show up everywhere. In fact, we thought about making a slideshow of thousands and thousands of chicken images, and it's pretty cool. And they really vary from, you know, a really beautiful uh, chicken here on the left to a sort of more abstract one here by Milton Avery. Um, carved chicken, statue chickens, chickens everywhere. Um, Here's forms again, showing up in lots of different places and in lots of different ways um, all across the world, not surprisingly, a very widespread order of birds. Um, hornbills, of course, are only showing up in a handful of places. So here's just some examples of some art that have hornbills. Um, so we hope that it'd be interesting as we increase sample size, whether or not we see representations of hornbills showing up uh, even if we expect it to be rare in areas outside where hornbills occur. And so as we get a bigger data set, one of the goals is to see whether or not um, abundance and diversity is, is easily predicted by the actual geographic origin of different groups. So we know our, and here's another one that's just an example. So here's a, a curlew, a brahinid um, native to Australia and only showing up in Australian art. But one way we know that we've cast too uh, small a net is, is in, it was 517 images we picked up only a single kingfisher, um, which shows us that our sample size was too small. Um, and then we have a cassowary here on the right, an ostrich hieroglyphic from Egypt. Um, so part of what was great here was to, you know, of course we coded the images and they were lines on a spreadsheet, but to actually look at the objects and see how people chose to represent birds, um, which as an ornithologist seemed pretty cool. So, not surprisingly, some things were miscoded. So this showed up in a database as a merganser, um, 
because we can't expect all our historical curators to be very good at their bird identification. So part of what we hope to do is to make better identifications and share those with curators to change their online database information. So, um, and then lastly, just as our little uh, diversion here through various pictures are, are some tropic birds from ocean. So, all right, so, so as I said, this was a pilot study and our goal was to really see whether or not this would work. Um, and I think it did, right? We were able to download a bunch of images, code them, and then start seeing some patterns. So our next steps are to work directly with museum IT departments to ask whether or not, rather than have to search through their online databases, whether they'd be willing to share uh, more efficient access and to download um, thousands of images and then use something like a machine learning approach to start coding and identifying. So, um, so I'd love to hear people's thoughts on this as we sort of get to the question period. Okay, so what I'd like to do then is give some more examples. Um, first, looking at some examples of modern art where there's some interesting ways where people specialized in using birds. Um, to talk about some contemporary examples and then open it up because it's a cafe for a conversation. Um, so, of course, birds show up very common in art that represents sporting themes, particularly those that are that are manly and early modern periods. Um, so. Many of you may have seen this classic Winslow Homer painting of, of two ducks. Um, uh, Joseph Stella had a particular affinity, another early modernist painter for, for ducks. And I really, I mean, for birds, I really like both of these. I love that he had a painting that he actually used widgeon in the title. Um, and then we have a cool stylized flamingo on the left-hand side. German Expressionism uses birds a lot from a symbolic perspective. Uh, so this is a, I really like this painting by, by Munter, of Breakfast of the Birds. Um, I think we can all relate to the idea of sitting quietly in the morning, watching birds out our window. Um, and so it's great to see this sort of expressionist representation of an activity that we all undertake. Um, another German expressionist is uh, Franz Mark, who uses animals a lot. He really liked mammals. He's got a great painting called Red Fox, but this is one called Birds. Um, that's just really cool. If I was wealthy enough, I would buy this painting and put it in my office. That's how much I like it. Um, so you can see that that in many of these representations, the sort of energy and vibrate, I mean, the, the figure of birds shows up a lot in paintings. Um, we also see lots of sketches, and this is one of the places where things might not show up as much in databases. Uh, so this is Egon Schiele, also from that same German Expressionist period. A beautiful little drawing here of a bird in the hand, um, kind of an unusual banding pose. Just kidding. Um, all right, and then again, thinking about how birds are used to represent um, modernism and movement. Uh, there's a from one of the futurists. This is Giacomo Ballas Swift's. Um, I don't know if any of you have seen that at the MoMA, but it's a very cool painting to see in person. Um, the Cubists. And symbolists really like birds. So here's a couple of Max Ernst in particular, really like birds. Um, so here's two cool representations. One, a bird head statue on the right, um, and then the painting on the left. And of course, Rancusi's famous bird sculpture. Um, and this is an image from the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Some of you may have seen some of the promotional material with this artist, Rufino Tamayo, drew a couple of really cool uh, bird paintings. Uh, this one's called Liberating Birds. Um, again, a pose many of us that band birds might be familiar with. Um, and then here's one called The Bird Watcher. Uh, again, mashing up very similar themes and activities that we undergo, but from a, a really interesting abstract perspective. And I actually wasn't aware until I started this project a couple years ago that Pablo Picasso had a pet owl um, that lived in his studio with him and shows up in a lot of his art. So on the left-hand side, you see a picture of him with his pet owl. Um, and there's lots and lots of examples of sculptures or paintings in which he incorporated that. Um, and so there's one on the right-hand side. And then this was a piece I would love to have seen by the artist, German artist, Kiki Smith. This is just a folio representing this, but at an exhibition in 1997, um, she did a 20-foot long uh, single print panel of birds that she had drawn from specimens lent to her uh, from a museum uh, to 
tell just from reading it uh, what the theme was she was trying to bring across here. And the idea here was on the fourth day when God created uh, animals and nature that now on the fourth day we're seeing birds being destroyed. So, okay, so I'd like to go just go through last before we open it up for some conversation. Um, talk about some cool, interesting contemporary projects that use birds. Uh, make sure I do these artists justice. So I'm gonna read from my notes here. Um, so this is a work by Jenny Kendler, as you can see from the name up here, uh, entitled Birds Watching. Um, and so what she's done is chosen 100 climate-threatened species in the United States uh, and built out this glass space to get people to see the different eye shapes and colors to think about bird diversity and what we might be missing. Um, for a while, the one on the right was represented at Storm King, which is a great outdoor sculpture and art space uh, in the Hudson Valley in New York. And the one on the left is, is permanently installed in Chicago. And these could be great examples for your classes of ways to think about how people are using art um, to ask broader questions about conservation. So many of you may be familiar with the Audubon Mural Project, um, just creating murals of climate-threatened birds uh, throughout um, Harlem. Um, and this was started after Audubon's survival by degrees that the climate bird impacts of climate change on bird study. Um, so here's just some pictures of some cool ones. Here's an American black duck on the East River. Um, you see the image at the top, and then there's a photo of the artist with the, the mural in the bottom right. Some of these apparently, I've only seen a handful of them, are on the storefronts. And so in order to get the full experience, you need to go when the stores aren't open and these doors are down. Um, so here's a great woodpecker in uh, Ibis. Um, and then there's the artists right there in front of it as well. And so you can see if I go back up here, Audubon Society has provided a map where you can go out early in the morning and walk around and see all these things. So um, here's another installation called Forgotten Songs by Michael Thomas Hill that was in Sydney in 2012. And what he did is he wanted to commemorate the songs of 50 bird species that used to be found in the Sydney area, but are now gone. On, uh, and so each empty birdhouse was meant to represent their loss, and he played their calls um, for people to hear that filtered down from these empty bird cages to make a point of, of lost biodiversity in the city. Uh, this one's called Midway, Message from the Jar by Chris Jordan, who uh, collected plastic, uh, and in most cases didn't even need to, but just went out and took photographs of, of dead seabirds that had ingested plastic um, in the ocean and then died on land. Um, so it's a series of these photographs that very vividly bring across the biodiversity crisis. Um, another one here is called The Dodo in Mauritius Island, Imaginary Encounters by Hadi Kalio, as you can see. Um, and so what the artist has done is done a reconstruction. Um, so sort of, you know, made an artificial bird, but laid it out in its native habitat so that people can get a sense of what we've lost um, with these photographic recreations uh, focused in particular on the dodo. So, um, and then the last one uh, is a project called Orbicles, which is a series of these towers um, that are based on the Forest Service Climate Change Bird Atlas. So each of these represents a different species and the colors of them are meant to change as the conservation status of each species changes. Um, but it isn't just a work of art, it's set up so that each of them um, will provide some sort of habitat housing. So if we look at it up close, you can see each of the species is labeled. And then if you look at them this way, they're set up to either serve as a bird house or to provide bird food or to work as a bird bath. So, well, okay. So I'd love to have a conversation with anyone that has questions or observations. Um, on any of the topics or birds and art in general. Let's just, yeah, be informal. All right, thank you, Dan, appreciate it. And if um, the Zoom audience wants to kind of um, make themselves visible by showing their video feed and you can feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question either of Dan right here or through the chat and we can read it, so. Um, but yeah, thanks, Dan. That was great. Yeah. Yeah, Dina, go ahead. Hi, thanks. That's great. I have been doing a little bit of this in Europe um, on recent trips to some of the museums there. 
And I'm just wondering if you would share with me how you organize your photos <laughs> in a, and how you keep all the data for a photo. I haven't found a good way to organize all my photos yet. Yeah, that has been a challenge. So what we've been doing is um, downloading and then labeling the image with all of the key information of the artist, the date, the museum, um, and then storing it. As I say, you can see each of these steps takes time. Um, right. and we have a Google sheet with all of the coded information that links to the location of the photo. And then we also, because we're pulling these from online databases, we have the link that the museum provides as a backup as well. Um, mm -hmm. But it's become, you know, to do 517 images, it was pretty cumbersome. And if we want to expand, we're just going to have to find a way to um, to do it more efficiently. So, yeah. Well, that's great. I'm super excited you're working on this. I have just started this myself the last couple of years, and I'm doing it as a side project. But I'm st I'm sticking to Europe, um, and kind of like 1300 to 1800. So maybe it'd be great to have a conversation with you sometime. Yeah, I would love to talk more. I would love that. It, it, the, the more the merrier, and we could join forces and think about. How I don't know if you're. I don't know if you're planning on going to. Um, are you going to the AOU meetings this year in Canada or no? I'm, I'm not. I'm not. You're not. I'm, I'm, I'm very uh, loyal to the AFO. And <laughs> No, Sorry I've been an to bring AOU up the, for, for many the competitor. I've been an AOS member for many, many years, but there's only so many meetings one can travel to. I know, I know. Well, thank you so much. That was great. And I'll get sure. with you. Yeah, thanks. That's fantastic. Thanks. Dan, why don't you call on people? You can okay. Do. I think Tim, Tim was the next one up. So uh yeah, thanks, Dan. That, that was great. And you you hit on so many things that I wasn't aware of. Um, so it was really cool. Uh, I, ha I have a particular affinity to those still lives uh, and the realism. And I'm just wondering if in your reading on, on the topic, um, would those always be birds represented as table fare or just birds that had been hunted and weren't necessarily uh, eaten? I think I saw a red kite in one of them. Um, and I'm just wondering if you know anything about that. Thanks. Uh, you know, that's a great question because I've often wondered the same thing that, you know, you often see things like herons and what look like sporting setups, but yet, are they only, you know, could they, you know, upland game is to be eaten, but it's hard to imagine that a heron would be delicious. Um, so I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Um, and it's sad to think that people would view killing a heron as sporty in itself, um, but they were different times, I guess. So. <laughs> All right, thanks. Sure. Hi, Jen. Hey Dan, sorry, I can't see my picture, so I'm not sure if this is uh, if you can see me or not. But um, great talk, um, really interesting subject. I'm really glad you did this one. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Um, did you look at um, kind of non? Um, I was going to say painting paintings. Um, so I'm specifically <clears throat> asking about um, like audio art, if that makes sense. So recordings of birds made into art. Did you think about and consider those? Does we that did. make sense? That's a great question. Yes, it does. I think that, um, I mean, like I said, we started with the idea that we would use the online search functions from these you know, big encyclopedic museums to see how the curators had coded them for us to pick up, knowing, of course, as I said, there were lots of biases. And so my guess is that if those kinds of things you're mentioning are there, they're so rare that our sort of initial foray didn't pick them up. Um, but it's clear that that's a, a key, you know, a, a, a group of information that we should get our hands on. The other thing we didn't look at were, you know, when feathers show up in art, but seem peripheral, you know, they're coded as having a bird in them and we put them in our database, but we're not analyzing them because it doesn't seem like it fits the spirit. Like if we're interested in how birds are represented, then you know sometimes feathers are meant to be representative of birds. Sometimes it's just a material object people use for for art. So we got to wrestle a little bit with how to handle that as well. So yeah, that that was going to be my second question about kind of artifacts of birds in art and things like that. Um, yeah. I'll let I've got a third question, but I'll let other people go. We could I could talk forever, <laughs> as you know. <laughs> well, might as well ask it. I'll see other hands. Oh, up. okay. Sorry, guys. Um, 
I was interested in representation of Indigenous art in your collection. Yeah, so it does seem just from, you know, the things that come back in the, in the database that uh, African art, if, if you think outside the, you know, American, West European canon of like, what are the objects that museums are collecting that are showing up in our search, that um, outside those two biogeographic regions that, that museums have a much heavier representation of African art than they do, for example, of art from, although some museums specialize in, you know, have New Guinea, art from New Guinea, for example, but it's much less common. And so we, we see that, you know, lots of places in the world just aren't represented. So we need to both get more objects per museum, but also go to some more specialist museums mm -hmm. to try to capture that, so. Cool. Thanks, Dan. And the other thing I'll say is that we, I, I try, it's a good excuse to, to use my work research money to go to museums because sometimes, you know, there's cool objects that have birds that aren't getting picked up in our database terms. So it's really important to see um, what we're missing to get a sense for how to refine the search terms. But it's also fascinating to see which objects get put on display, right? And museums, you know, only have, just like the natural history museums, only a very small portion of the collection gets displayed and what are the choices that curators make in terms of like what the public sees it seems like a really important gatekeeping function. And I know that museums are thinking a lot harder about making that more inclusive, but it's, it's still a challenge because museums charge admission in order to survive and people come to see and go, so. Yeah, that makes me think of a question too. Um... I understand this is a whole bunch of work, but I think you're just kind of sparking all these interests in us and encouraging us to think about other ways it can be applied, but like wearable art, especially when we're thinking about indigenous communities. And some of that is found in museums, but I don't know how much of it is found in the museums, maybe the Smithsonian, right? But we could think about um, dresses and headpieces and stuff like that, which would have feathers that many people have identified, I think, um, scholars of that area to certain birds, but I, that might be getting at a different question than what you're, what's really sparking your interest, so. No, that's a great idea. I put that down. We clearly need to cast a wider net, so um, that's a question. YouTube, thanks for that, Tim. Um, did we only survey art on display or did we survey the collections cabinets? So in this case, we were very dependent on what was in online databases, which some museums have had the resources in order to label objects. Uh, yeah, I guess I'm just, they, they, maybe you're typing that in, Tim, thank you. Um, what shows up in databases and we're clearly missing pieces that are in the collection but have not been digitized, so. Maria. Uh, hey Ben, thank you, thank you for your talk. I'm sorry if my English is not so so good, but I I am wondering if in, if in your collection you include uh, bills for, from different countries, like the ones from Costa Rica. They have a lot of different um, well drawings, illustrations of birds, or like here in, I'm from Colombia, no, so um, there is an old bill um, that has like Ten endemic species uh, drawn on it, so I don't know if if you include include those that that type of collection. <laughs> I, I mean, I think we would like to, and we need to figure out um, how to better include that. And so, one thing I was hoping is this conversation would give me lots of of ideas of places that we should be looking and have it. So that's really helpful. Thank you. Um, I mean, ideally, it would be great to contact you know, the National Museum of every country, which would be a great place to, to sort of get what ought to be the best representation, knowing, of course, that many countries' art was taken in, to Europe. So we certainly need to be cognizant of that. But that was, yeah, that's a great suggestion. Thank you. So. Have a lull in conversation, so I could just. Oh, Dale. Hey, Dan. Enjoyed it. Great talk. Um, 
Did you have any examples of birds that showed up in lifelike poses after they were thought to be extinct? Was there a temporal component there that would be of interest? Um, goodness me. Uh, no, in part because our sample size is small. I'm trying to think of an example. You mean like a painting of an ivory bill? Like that was dated some of the or, parrots, you know, yeah. seabirds. Um, yeah. So, so that's what the the this uh, paper in in Portuguese was intending, not necessarily to see about whether something was thought to be extinct and would show up, but to ask these temporal questions about, um, you know, how abundant or were these things being seen at times when their range restrict, you know, might have been restricted or population size has gotten smaller. Um, and so, I mean, it's a fascinating question that unfortunately only lends itself to maybe a handful of groups that are super distinctive. I mean, you could think about, you know, species of macaws look different enough. And then of course, we're making the assumption that the artists are representing them realistically, which might not be true all the time. Um, but this idea about like zoo archeology span of using sort of how people have represented things over time to ask questions about conservation is a really fascinating one. So, thanks, Kevin. How are you? Oh, I think you're muted. You're muted, Kevin. Sorry about that. You'd think after three years of Zoom meetings constantly that <laughs> everybody would know to unmute themselves right away, but uh, apparently not. So I really enjoyed it. That was fun. Uh, I do have a couple of questions. Two questions. Uh, one is, as someone who has been asked to identify birds from, you know, at Cornell, we get these things where they're like, you know, what's this bird on this particular vase or whatever, you know? Um, what do you do with the ones that you're not confident about? I mean, I'm, again, I looked at your one of your hornbill things, and I have to admit, I would have scored that as an ibis, but... Um, you know, sometimes it's it's just not that easy to to tell. And and do you have a category of yep, that's definitely a bird, but we're not putting it into order because yeah, it's a bird. Yes, we do. We have a bunch that are a bird. You know, and sometimes when they're abstract, they're not really meaning to represent it. Although clearly, you know, some things can only be a songbird. Um, I would say that I need to go through and clean up these IDs. In fact, I might send some to you to look at because I started with. <laughs> my student doing it and she came back with some really crazy identifications. Um, so we invested in a series of field guides of like more or less the world now um, in order to try to cross reference um, with, I think we, I, you know, I thought we'd do better than we could. And now really, if we get things to order, we'll be happy. So uh, what, what have been some of the things uh, that you've been asked to identify? What have they turned out to be? Oh, man, some of them are just, um, I forget. The, we got something from who somebody who was, uh, you know, Cornell, it's a pretty uh, open place with anybody could be studying something from anywhere. And I remember getting some, a couple of really old European things that were, you know, fairly stylized type bird. And... And some of them, of course, are, are totally fake birds, right? That that's just the artist's imagination. That we see that all the time with with uh, people painting things that look like uh, macaws with a with a cockatoo crest, right? Because that's how they. Yeah. It's like, oh yeah, and we'll give it a long tail, we'll put a big crest on it, and we'll just make it fancy as all get out. So you know, it, it is a again a a big ask to to think that they're actually trying to represent a real bird. Now, I, I wouldn't say that's true, especially with the, like the Dutch painters and things like that, that they went into hyper-realism. Then, then those, I trust those, right? I would definitely say that those things are, are they're trying to be as, as real as they can be. So yeah, it's an interesting thing. It's, it's, it's kind of fun. I have to, but I have to say it some of the times I don't, you know, when people are trying to draw a bird, I don't know what bird they're doing. And it's, it's you know, something in their backyard. So it's, it's I know the bird. I just don't recognize their rendition of it as as that particular bird. My second question is prosolariforms were like in the middle of your list there of like the, you know, like the median most commonly painted birds. What was that? I was I was hoping you would show some of those. 
Uh, yeah, I think it was here. Let me pull up the database. I think it was like a big cash from the same museum. Hang on. It was doing like what albatrosses from yes, sailing exactly. ships. That's exactly, that's exactly Something right. like that. Yep, there was a bunch of different albatross related things. That's exactly what it was. Let's see what museum that was. So, yeah. I figured that it had to be something like that because it's like, wait, what? It's like, I understand parrots and I understand chickens, but prosolaire forms, that was uh, that was just a, an unexpected one. So yeah, I figured it had to be yeah. albatross. And I think that, that probably wasn't really going to be no uh, prions or, uh, or diving petrels or anything like that. So. Right, right. I think that that just really reflects the, you know, the danger of our small sample size. So we, we want to boom that up. Um, yeah, a lot of the British Museum has a lot of things from like Australia, New Zealand, Tahiti, um, all those. So, right. Good, Thanks. Good question. Good question. So, um, yeah. Are there uh, other thoughts? If we'd love to hear from people, just like your observations or interests in birds and art, like what drew you to the talk or just, yeah. Yeah, but if you don't mind, I'll, I'll jump in real quick on that, Dan. So as you know, one of my uh, strong interests is music, particularly underground and independent uh, music. And one thing that's always fascinated me is how frequently birds show up in art, especially in aggressive and extreme metal and punk and hardcore um, bands and it's really interesting to think about a lot of the themes through history that you've touched on and how those manifest in music as well and just to follow up with on um, kevin's comment I mean, albatross shows up very frequently in a lot of uh northern hemisphere music metal and punk and um this is a rabbit hole that i wanted to go down a lot more um and so not really a question per se, but I just wanted to bring that up that it's really interesting how this mirrors in music and particularly how music is depicted visually in art forms, especially in, in things like uh, in underground metal and punk and hardcore and things like that. Why do you think albatross have such, um, yes, Scott Johnson just asked a similar kind of, why does it have such resonance with underground metal? So it's, uh, yeah, I think there's a, <laughs> there's a lot you can talk about there. I mean, and the way it's been depicted historically in literature probably plays out um, within, within some of those music genres. You've got like one of the largest wingspan birds of the world, but you can't go eagle because then you're imperialist. So you have to maybe go. Uh, <clears throat> that's my hypothesis. I'm throwing out the cross around the neck. Uh, <laughs> See that that is yeah. exactly the kind so that, of that's, that's my brainstorming question. That we hope for. Like, yeah. <laughs> Go, please, Kevin. No, no, it's the same thing. It's like a, you know, I think of the rhyme of the ancient mariner too. It's like an albatross around your neck, yep. and and it's like a, you know a dark thing pulling you down or holding you back. And so I sort of get that if that's the way it's being used in there. It's not like it's oh yeah. Uh, punk rock likes to to hear about uh, heavy metal likes to think about this spectacularly flying bird that doesn't flap its wings for like three days and stays in the air and or is it that it's like somebody's got it around their neck but it, it's not just that i mean uh, passerines and, and parrots and there's a wide diversity and in, in folk music as well it, it really comes out in like gig posters as well um things that are very ephemeral um in a lot of independent music and anyway just some observations I've had over the years being rather music obsessive. And it, it was neat to kind of think about that as you went through the timeline and, and what you presented uh, today. So thanks for that. Sure. Great observation. Cool. Maria. Um, hi. Uh, well, I can't see myself now. Okay. I, I was like, maybe like not about the albatross thing, but just another direction of random thought but I was wondering like especially after the renaissance like if maybe uh painters would have to learn or would be like because they were interested in painting more realistically or trying to like actually represent reality they would have to go to school 
to learn like bird anatomy or if they so I was wondering if there there was something like schools that were like special specialized in teaching folks how to paint birds I don't know uh or something like that and then I I, I just a kind of connected thought would be like because you mentioned the studies so like when when painters sometimes do studies like before they they produce the final uh like uh painting then maybe like you would have a bunch of studies of birds that didn't end up on the final uh painting or something like that i don't know it's just two thoughts that i had just now so yeah, those are great thoughts, and please others jump in. Um, I mean, my impression is that much of the training that people receive to do that kind of realistic work with birds would be folks in natural history museums that would be working from a scientific illustration perspective, and that much of the sort of classical art training was very focused on people rather than animals. So, like, if you think of examples of artists that really stand out as being great animal painters they really do sort of fill that niche like there's a british painter named george Stubbs that apparently was like the best painter of horses in the whole english letter um you know painting history and that people would you know bring him in to paint their horses um I, on the second part I, I agree with you that that lots of these sort of prints and drawings the kinds of things that museums just have stacked up in collections but are rarely displayed would be an enormously important source of information in part because they would be like less stylized right that they'd just be like people's observations or they would worry less about how it would end up in the, the overall artwork and that's why i love that little shile one that had you know the bird on his hand like was he handling birds like was he feeding it like how did he have access to get a drawing like that and it looks like the kind of drawing one would do if if they were actually observing it themselves so um and those, unfortunately, are many of those prints and drawings are the, some of the least likely objects to be entered into an online database. So, um, yeah, it's a great observation. We'd certainly love to be able to pull through the collections of our museums, to, but whether I'll be able to build enough credibility with art historians to be turned loose in their basements, I don't know. We'll see, I hope. Please, Dana. To add, Dan, about the training, at least what I've seen from the Dutch masters is that they were really specific, either guilds or workshops where they just, that was pre-school, pre-art schools, basically. And that's why there's very few women that did that kind of drawing early on. Um, you had to be working with, from a very young age, some of these artists started as early as like 12 or 13 and had a mentor, basically. And when it worked in that workshop, so you see like different groups coming out of the Dutch tradition, the Flemish area at that point, basically they trained with another artist and then became skilled at that. So that is crazy because it's pre-scientific collections. It's basically, you know, you wonder what their studios look like or where they were getting observations. Now at some point they could go to menageries and look at these royal menageries, but this is all patron driven at this point, you know, mostly driven by the aristocrats and the patrons who had a lot of money. So they had these collections, but it wasn't widely available. It's very specific artists and the specific places like Antwerp in Belgium, which is now Belgium, but was part of the Netherlands. So it's really, it's fascinating to think about, like it's pre ornithology as we know it, but it is the beginning of Western ornithology, like it's it's very cool. <laughs> yeah, and that's a great observation that really reinforces the idea that, like especially with the parrots back when they were quite uncommon, that the only place people saw them were with the rich because they mm -hmm. were so exotic and hard to get. Mm -hmm. And like many things, right? Then more people get access, and suddenly parrots are everywhere, and they show up all the time. And so. Right. After the revolution, the French Revolution, you get your first big zoo, right? And then zoos become the thing. And then as you see the fall of the aristocratic class, well, you then you see birds and other things, sh animals showing up by nobles. I mean, there's really fascinating work being done by art history scholars in these animal studies programs 
And like you, Dan, I'm just finding out about all these animal studies programs. <laughs> and I kind of like wish it would have been around when I was in, you know, grad school, because it's so fascinating, like the interdisciplinarity and multidisciplinarity of these of these programs, because they're looking at all of these questions related to class, gender, um, like you said, imperialism, but also just things about how the nobles or some of the courtiers started to use birds and hunting imagery to kind of rebel against the idea of an absolute monarchy and how some of these things might have even led to like growing discontent and you know the revolution like it's it's really it's kind of cool like the, the 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 amount of history and the amount of culture and things you can get just by looking at birds and art has really blown my mind. <laughs> it's really captured me. Like, I think it has you, Dan, where you're like, wow, how come we never talked about these things in ornithology? We weren't even thinking. Like, it's kind of a new way to think about ornithology. So I'm glad to see so many people here. And thank yeah, you. Yeah, love that. This. Uh, really can cool. I comment quickly on, on what you said, Dina, about the, the fact that there weren't scientific collections? This used to be one of my standard things that when I when I was a curator of birds and mammals at Cornell and I would tour people through, it's like it's the invention of arsenic soap in the early 1700s that allowed people to actually preserve bird skins for the very first time in, a, in an archival way. And that basically we have no feathers from before 1720, right? Because they just, the, the bugs eat them, right? And, and so that's, so when you're looking back at these things about the these birds coming to Europe, if it's in the 16, 1500s, they those weren't they weren't going to museums and looking at stuffed specimens. They were not because they did not exist. And so I think that's an important little timeline thing to to keep in mind. Thanks for thanks for mentioning that. Thanks, I, Eduardo. I would like to make a comment that uh, following Kevin's question. Uh, it's true that many museums have uh, the specimens preserved with the uh, um, chemicals in the 1800s, uh, maybe some even more, much older, like in the British museums, there are specimens from the 1700s. But there are lots of art, pre-Hispanic art, particularly um, many of the Aztec, Maya, and Incas mix feathers of birds, some skins of birds, and even the Egyptians in textiles. And they are part of the um, clothes that people were wearing, but includes part of the feathers or part of the skin with feathers of the birds. And they use other chemicals and very few people have been working. And there is a lot of people in Latin America that I know uh, particularly from Peru and Colombia and Mexico, that they are famous for their ethno-ornithology books and papers that have been publishing for many years. Just two years ago, Lourdes Navarijo, who just passed away from COVID, um, she did a wonderful book of recollecting all the history of ethno-ornithology through the Americas. And uh, that's a fascinating work. Unfortunately, it's only in Spanish available. Thanks for that. Good to see you, Eduardo. Good to see you. I'm glad that we have something and, more common than Golondrina. Yeah. <laughs> um, Anne Clark has her hand up. Plus, that's a great chicken picture, too. So, uh, Well, that was Henrietta. We weren't given to uh, real creative names, unfortunately, as a child. Um, great chicken. Anyway, um, the I have two questions. One is uh, kind of a follow up and just in terms of where things might be found. It's interesting. I'm thinking about some of the Renaissance tapestries and you would never get them listed in a museum as in terms of the birds that they feature, but they're absolutely full of them. And I'm wondering if I mean, they'd be big pieces, too. So um, that would be seems like tapestry collections would be a great place where there's kind of a melange of people and and uh background yeah um, and let me follow <laughs> an excellent uh, uh point you made i just recently saw in the british in the uh, met 
around December. I spent the last five months in New York City, and I spent some time in the Met walking, and I happened to see the exhibition of the Tudors, which was the art and majesty of the Renaissance in England. And they have a huge tapestry made in the in the 1500s. Uh, it estimated between 1540 to 1550. It was just right after uh, Cristobal Colón was traveling to the Americas, and it already had an angel um, in the in the tapestry. So it's a huge tapestry, it's the size of the whole wall on, on the museum, and it has the wings. The angel has the wings of the scarlet macaw, which is as you know, one of my ornithological specialities working with parrots. And the scarlet macaw, looking at the feathers, is not only the scarlet macaw, but is the scarlet macaw, aramacao macaw, which is the subspecies from Central America and not with the green, which is the aramacao cyanoptera from South America, which was very interesting to see there. That's such a detail. Must, must clearly have done it from some kind of specimen to get that kind of detail. Um, so my second <clears throat> question is totally lighthearted, but um, we hear a lot about, uh, or at least there are associations between pirates and uh, and parrots, <clears throat> and I'm and it made me think of it was your uh, maps of the travel routes and whatnot, which of course were frequented by pirates, and I'm just curious if you run into either any sort of pictures that link pirates and parrots, but also if if that's an interesting question in terms of their role in, in moving moving animals around. I have not read anything to that regard, but that's a really, really cool observation. I'm gonna see what I can find. I love that. I have no information to provide you at this point <laughs> other than that. <laughs> Maria. I, I... The idea of the pet tapestry reminded me of something. I uh, maybe uh, you know the maybe ca calligraphy, ca calligraphy, mm -hmm. the Islamic uh, art that where and they used to draw um, around like at the margins of the pages uh, of the Quran, for example, or other maybe sacred like not sacred but like important books. So maybe they have birds there too. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, the, the, I'll admit that the, our, the, the, I don't know if it's a dream because that seems a little extreme, but my hope is that we'll be able to get access to thousands and thousands of images and then use, um, so I do a lot of work with camera traps where we have like 3 million images of, of animals in the wild and we built a little detector that goes through and labels things of a particular kind is to get all of these images whether they're labeled with bird or not like the tapestries or calligraphy or whatever it is and then use this machine learning tool to detect stuff that, that we then can go and try to identify in order to cast a wider net um, i mean that sounds like years in the making but that's the hope is to, to capture that kind of stuff and it would be super cool like part of the goal like why are albatross, I mean, they're more common than we'd predict, and it would be neat to find other examples of birds, bird groups, bird families, locations in the world where, like, these representations are, are unexpected in ways beyond just sort of, like, the standard art historical understanding of symbols, like pigeons, of course, show up everywhere because they have all this symbolism, but, like, what's up with an albatross, like, that kind of thing, so... Well, this regarding is a great question, conversation. Oh, please, Edward. Sorry. The iconographic. If you visit the Morgan Library uh, in New York City, which is another of the places I visit, they have an amazing collection of 3,400 to 2,000 um, years ago of the writing of the Mesopotamia region. And they have already in those icons, which are the size of one to two inches. Uh, iconographic texts that they were doing in Mesopotamia with almost 5,000, 7,000 years ago with birds, ostriches. You can identify the ostriches fighting with some of the warriors. They have some people also in the fields with geese and ducks trying to trap them. So there's a lot of uh, 
information that I was going to ask you, if you are only concentrated in the ID of the species or you're looking also more deeper, like into the behavior, like in these two cases that I saw there was hunting and the other one was fighting, you know, the ostriches were chasing these warriors in the fields. I mean, the behavior is cool. I think it's beyond where we are now. And there, there have been, there was a, a great book on uh, birds and Egyptian art that that whole chapter on behavior that was looking at that kind of thing. It's really fascinating. Um, but for now, I feel like I've already bit off more than I can handle. Um, but we should, if we're gonna go to the trouble to code them, we ought to code what they're doing. So, okay, so maybe we'll add that to our thing. I see that Sarah has unmuted her or opened her. I, yeah, I was just going to gonna jump in. I, I'm on my phone though, so I can't, I don't have, I can't figure out how to put my hand up from my phone. So I just, um, but yeah, I'm showing my art behind me. Hopefully, I don't know, Charlie Harper's up there. But um, my, I, my, what I was wondering about, and it's a little bit different angle, is whether you can or should maybe try to develop an index of, imagination <laughs> or abstractness because some of the art is realistic and it is identifiable to species and but others you know one of my of course pet peeves as an ornithologist is you go to walmart you see things with birds on them that are completely you know totally abstract there, there's no recognizable species features on these totally invented birds and so i i just i do think that there's this kind of an interesting uh, component of it that is, I don't know, artistic license or, or or something where people do make up birds. And Kevin mentioned this earlier as well, is that how far back does that go? And to what extent is realism or accuracy in the depiction a characteristic you wanna to try to track or chart in some way? Is that an important component of what you're doing? Because uh, anyway, that, those were that was my thought. No, it's a great idea. I mean, it, you know, if, if part of what we're looking for are what patterns emerge, then you know, yeah. there, is there variation in the kinds of birds that are abstracted? So, yeah, or even your ability to identify what bird the bird the artist might have been looking at when they did the art. You know, for some of that, the older European ones with the imported uh you know parrots and like the macaw wings that we just mentioned and there's some real specific details where you could really nail it down to the species and stuff but other stuff you really can't <laughs> it seems to me you know just an idea tim just put something in the chat yeah that looks um that's cool Well, this was great. I really appreciate this conversation. And um, if you guys were a friendly audience to roll out a project I've been worried about telling anyone about. So it's a great conversation. And um, I look forward to talking with more of you. And Scott Johnson said, uh oh, now people are going to email or text you pictures of birds they see in museums. But please do. So, but if you do take a picture of, the, of a thing with birds, can you follow it up with a picture of the label right after that so that we can yeah, code it? So, let's, well, well, thanks, thanks again, Matt, everybody. Sure. Really appreciate you coming, Dan. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but- No, it was good. I was just thanking you and Matt, so. <laughs> and appreciate the audience. So thank you all for coming. We hope to see you next month and um, have a great rest of your January and a good weekend. <laughs>